There we go. Uh, this is the Fellowship of the Link call for Wednesday, March 1, 2023. Uh, and we are off. And just by, by means of check-in, um, I, uh, I mentioned this on Free Jury's Brain on Monday. I set up a new talk I'd like to give in places uh, called My Life as a Cyborg. And um, we puzzled through whether Cyborg or Centaur or something else and a couple other questions on Monday. But, but uh, this, uh, my wife April posted about it on LinkedIn. That got a bunch of questions and traffic. And so I'm sitting down thinking, well, okay, I'd love to do this. I'd love to get some attention for it. What does it mean to be a good cyborg? And, and how do we do something about that together? How does that fit into our different projects? Because because um, I, th I think I'm more motivated toward this question by other people's explorations with chat GPT than I am with my own extensions into uh, the brain, you know, extensions through the brain and stuff like that. But I think that the nexus of those things colliding is really um, is juicy and important and interesting. Like like how do you know how does the agora mix with massive mix with chat gpt mix with my brain mix with other other sorts of things and uh, i was just metaphorically using a bunch of pots simmering on the stove with pete before you got on the call it's like how do we how do we make a you know a stew out of uh, out of those things that is uh, nourishing that sounds uh, yes very uh, very interesting and very much like what we want and like, uh, I guess I, I just sort of like fussily believe that it will happen this year. Uh, and it will take more, like, you know, like more weeks than I usually expect as usual, like for everything. Right. But like, it just seems like it's coming. Yeah. Somehow. I think so. Um, yeah. Uh, there is like, uh, we did some, some, just some very short experiments with like the GPT API and by we, I mean beta, who is also part of the other project. Uh, with the Agora like what a year ago or so, mm -hmm. and it was really interesting how it just picked up on like our specific uh, patterns, and you you know like you could even back then ask it to like essentially generate a node for an entity, and it will follow the Agora conventions, uh, and this is what well, we before everything hmm. <laughs> before JBT uh, and so on happened. I, I guess my. My particular position here, I don't know, like I would love to like uh, read that. I, ha I haven't, if you have a link, I will uh, check it out or uh, or you tell me where to go for links in general, like uh, export from your brain. But like, I guess my, my I, I'm particularly interested in exploring one aspect of this maybe uh, beyond the actual generation or like experiments, which are definitely gonna be fun and interesting. Uh, so for, for me, uh, massive wikis and agoras, and uh, to some extent, you know, like uh, federations of brains, or you know, however we want to to uh, um, to call those. Uh, for for me, they they may solve the governance issue to some extent, uh, in the sense of like how groups of people can uh, gather a, a corpus to like fine tune like a, a language model, and then agree to 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 use it, right? Or to like rent it, or you know, whatever the the, the free media community wants uh, is. Uh, in particular, even that, you know, it seems like one of the pitfalls here is like, you know, uh, your know, copyright and how to share uh, profits from like models, like, you know, like stable diffusion, how could stable diffusion like pay back to artists, for example, no? I think that's, uh, uh, we may, uh, like lacking like uh, some distributed way of agreeing on what's okay to train and use and what's not. Uh, it seems like maybe like the, the biggest companies that can essentially influence copyright law may get away with it, and all the others may not, right? That's, that will be a, a, ter a terrible failure mode, no? So I, I guess to work around that, we could just pull together our own corpora, uh, I guess. I think I'm following you, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure I am. Um, whether this is a question about intellectual property rights or this question about uh, commons and how to build commons, uh, right. or or how that proceeds. And I'm thinking here about hip hop culture, where there was a lot of sampling done, mm -hmm. and sort of before hip hop culture, sampling was clamped down on heavily by the music industry, I think. And then mm -hmm. suddenly hip hop is like, hey, guess what? You know, here's a song that samples 30 different songs. Come and get, come and catch me, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly the sampling 
loosened or was more feasible or whatever, and suddenly you could see music everywhere. And is, is that what's happening for images or is this just the, the destruction of all creative talent for illustrators and artists and, and, and everything else? I, I think it would be interesting to find out. My, 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 I, I'm not sure that there was a lot of sampling before hip hop. There was certainly, but not necessarily a lot. And then hip hop basically started the sample culture and then the RIAA or whoever got upset about that. The, the reason it happens nowadays is because they figured out how to do the, the cross billing for it. Um, so everybody got spanked and their, their hands got slapped. And then it's like, you can't sample. We'll, we'll see you. We'll see you if you sampled. Um, but go ahead and sample and pay us, and that's fine. So it was the the market mechanism um, to to make the copyright holders happy that that made it possible that you could have sampling. Kind of, it, it's similar. You know, that it's it's funny to me now that I see non official people putting up YouTube videos with soundtracks or even like whole chunks of video. Um, for a while, that was something that you know would get you kicked. Now, a lot of the times, it just gets monetized, right? It's like, and YouTube says, "Oh, I know what clip you're using, and I'm, you know, we're monetizing um, the the copyright holder." Mm -hmm. So, it, and that's that's actually even I think more automated than than the hip hop thing. In the hip hop thing, what happened was, if you're a record producer, you you, you got the you got the hint, um, you're going to get sued unless you write down who who you sampled and you start sending them checks however that connection is made um in the youtube thing they just detect it and they they just you know do the right thing right it's like i i guess that that's a pattern where like i guess in my mind i have this file as like flow network i guess maybe a confusion because because you know like networks used for like flow uh, you know, flow problems in algorithms, which I've always been in love with, I guess. Uh, and, you know, like once you see this, it's sort of like a commons. Once you see this, uh, you can find them everywhere. I mean, society to some extent is flowing resources all the time by definition, I guess. So we do. And like, um, yeah, I, I will agree that what YouTube does now is like, it's way more pro social. And I'm sort of surprised at how, and, and even like, you know, flowing profits uh, for transcluded. Uh, um, uh, like resources, I think was one of the core uh, uh, aspects of, of the Nelsons, uh, you know, like I guess, uh, yep. a pitch for Sanado, no? Yep. And we are still on, aren't in there. Like, essentially, you know, we don't have a way of like including, you know, copyright content in some other platform and then using, you know, a YouTube's infrastructure to like actually forward um, the monetization. I'm not aware of any, uh, I mean, there's probably many, right? But off the top of my head, I'm not aware of any protocols for flowing, you know, like essentially like solving the, the sampling uh, or the mashup yeah. uh, uh, problem, I guess. It's, I, I think I, the, the big publishers suppress that kind of stuff. Right. They want um, to keep it to like whoever they can meet with on the table. I guess, yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and as soon as it, you know, if it was, flowing through the network rather than being through the publishers, they would have less control. Um, other, you know, other smaller competitors would come up and, and essentially eat all their profits, or at least I'm sure right. that's what they, they worry about. Um, I, you know, there's one more thing. Uh, uh, the image generators are a good example of it. And then the chat bots are similar. The, The, the image generators got into a problem because we realized that there's an asset that hadn't been being called an asset. Um, so uh, if you're a famous artist, the thing that you're pissed off at um, Midjourney and Stable Diffusion and, and um, Dali for is not copying any of your works. It's copying your style. Mm -hmm. um, so style used to be something that you couldn't steal. Um, so it was never, mm -hmm. you know, it was never recognized as an asset. And so 
the image generators started stealing styles um maybe you know maybe you i one argument is that well you know pablo picasso said it you know good artists seal um we've been stealing styles from one another for hundreds of years that's nothing new um but but then it became systematized and at scale and anybody could steal you know it wasn't a fine artist who could steal your style it was anybody you know running dolly or mid-journey um so so i think a, a chunk of a, a chunk of the what we and so chat GP, gpt is the same thing right it's not that it's copying any of your copyrighted works but if it's read your copyrighted works then your you know your um the way that you think about things or it's maybe even the some of the, the phrases that you've coined are going to end up you know in its writings you know and and some people are sensitive about that and maybe they should be maybe they shouldn't be i don't know yeah i mean that's a great observation peter i think yeah uh, like uh, the yeah i think you're spot on with like style being uh and what an uh, unrecognized asset yeah yeah Hmm. So I guess there's, I would expect there to be like, so, I mean, I wonder if you can develop any kind of like watermarking for style. Hmm. Um, it's doesn't, I'm not sure. What, what's I, interesting. I, I don't uh, think I would. Um, yeah. uh, um, although that's that's an interesting tack to take down I, just the, the 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 big problem is that we have a disagreement whether or not style is an asset right okay. um so i i think where it kind of fell down was, or or where it fell out where where it got to um where i i haven't followed this very carefully but the image generator people who are have image generators said okay we'll back off uh we won't we'll try to make it so people can't copy the style of living, you know, living artists at least. Um, uh, so I, I think the, the, the fix is not so much watermarking a style. The fix is just having style recognized as an asset and right. being able to go to uh, intellectual property court and say, you know, look, there's a bunch of people making art that looks like mine. I own this style, um, you know, they shouldn't, and I'm going to sue them or whatever, right? Um, uh, I guess this is where, like, I, uh, should, uh, sorry, uh, Jerry, go ahead. Uh, just a couple of brief things. Style is kind of what a mature artist develops. It's like, like you know you're getting somewhere when you, when you have an identifiable style and people start asking for the thing that you do. So style is really kind of important, even if it's, like, not really uh reified or honored or otherwise sort of picked out the way pete's describing mm -hmm. um and then i don't know how you prevent one of these engines from imitating any any particular style that what they're what they're good at is essence what they're good at is oh i know a maple leaf when i see a maple leaf and i can tell you that this is a maple and that's an that's an elm leaf because i know about the essence of what makes things mapley and what makes things sort of elmy or oaky um, hey, Chris. Um, and and also, uh, even if you could parse out all the living artists to not interrupt their deals, there's there are a few entities worse on the planet than the inheritors of famous art, who yeah. fam famously are uh, basically shut down all attempts to do anything useful with their art for the most part. They're like heirs. I don't. I do not like heirs of of art and all that kind of stuff. They're pretty shitty. Or, or corporations that uh, you know, like pull uh, rights and then like uh, through the criminal life for hundred years. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess in general. Oh, sorry, Grace. Uh, I can hit that. Um, in general, uh, I guess my first reaction is always like it's uh, also like like in, i guess i'm conservative in this sense like well uh, depending on how you frame it like better not to limit creativity in any way even assisted by um 
by models because of the, of the risks, you know, uh, uh, like the chilling effect, like, like unfollow. And I guess, yeah, limiting style seems like something we you will do before models, right? Because you, like like we just said, like it wasn't recognized as a particular like like an attack vector or like a, something you could exploit. Then we get this new tool, and now we have to limit creativity in some sense more than before. So it seems like it could be like a, like jumping uh, uh, like uh, too fast on it, and maybe like screwing up for future generations. Uh, and also like the living artist only. I mean that's uh, of course like I guess in a wood timeline that yields renegotiation discussion on copyright law in general, which I think is, has gotten completely unreasonable. Totally out of hand. Yeah. But like, um, yeah, uh, it seems like uh, it could be dangerous as well in some sense. Um, and so there's the general question of, is this the end of traditional copyright? Is this just, is are the copyright holders going to reassert some kind of control and try to crack down? Eh, no. Don't know. Maybe it's time for the copyright revolution. <laughs> uh, it's been It's been time for that for a very long time. Right. But in this case, you know, imagine like all these tools, a lot of uh, young people, uh, like every opinion, you know, like a lot of people using Mid Journey in Discord and, you know, like getting a taste on of what like cyber creativity is to some extent. And then like a law, like a lawmaker comes over and says, like, well, actually, all these things you are enjoying, like, are now illegal. You need to pay uh, for, you know, like, and one person gets the right of like generating this. I maybe it won't fly for a change. In particular, given that uh, we are talking about it's a, a phenomenon that is, that is global, I, I'm still like actually when you're like a, when I think about like explaining to an alien, you know, like as a as a framing device, I still I'm unsure if I could explain the, the our current copyright state even before this uh, possible revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, like it seems like once the, once you have a global internet, I will have given copyright like fewer years than it has had so far since then. <laughs> To survive its current form, and somehow like the conglomerates that hold copyright and the influence treaties are strong enough that they are uh, keeping it uh, upright. Uh, and you know, I, I'm interested. Has do, do any of us know of any efforts to rethink copyright thoroughly around the world that that seem interesting and fruitful? Um, one thing I thought of years ago was I wanted to suggest to Google, for example, that they create attribution servers. And, and one of the problems is that copyright conflates attribution with control, with ownership, with a couple other things. And I think attribution, this is just my personal take, attribution is extremely important. Need to know that this person had an idea and then look at all these interesting riffs on it. But what I, what I was looking for was some kind of uh, search engine where you could send yes. it a snip of something, a piece of a tune, an image, uh, a, a, some prose, and it would come back and say, "My, the earliest I can ever find anybody doing this is this thing over here. And then here is a tree of the apparent derivatives of that, the way you would do genetic gene mapping of COVID. Like here are all the variants of that work. And all for the purpose of, oh, I'd like to reward the originator. And then you could send a tip basically upstream to just the root or to the performance you just heard that was particularly good and the root and split it 50-50 or whatever but 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 if if there was attribution that was well done then you could have tipping and i'm in favor of letting intellectual property like go in the world and and, and touch people without paywalls and, and 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 lockdowns but then i'm in favor of making it really easy to reward creation and performance of all those things like really 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 transparently easy because uh, the easier it is the more likely anybody's is to try to do that thing and patronage tipping has gotten a little bit of traction, but not a ton of traction in, in you know, online. Uh, go ahead, Pete. Uh, I was totally, I, I, I think I almost agree. Um, except, except for the idea of, of paying somebody because they were the, the root node, um, even tipping them. Um, so not that you shouldn't be able to tip somebody, right? But assuming that that's kind of the revenue model, I think it, it's still in the old world, right? Um, How do you mean? mean? Well, 
Um, well, they might evolve several different norms or modes of tipping up the stream. And I and like the, that, that, that idea of tipping to the root node is just the first idea, the first thought that came to my yeah. head. I haven't really thought it through. I, 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 it's, it's not, it's not um, bad in and of itself, but it, it's, a, it's enough like the old model that it's dangerous. It's, it's really dangerous to, to think that way or to talk with other people that way. Mm -hmm. um, but so, it may make it more likely to be adopted. Hmm? So this is it, may, it may make it more likely to, to be adopted by the incumbents. Yeah, partly that. And partly it's just the, it's, it's the wrong model to be paid for creativity. Um, hmm. uh, it, it, that's, that's the root of the poison of the well, kind of. Hmm. Um, and it goes all the way back to that. Huh. So uh, I, I think you should be famous uh, for being the originator. Um, and hmm. people should come to you and say, it's funny, the person I think of is Shepard Fairy. I don't know if, hmm. if he would be the root of the Shepard Fairy look, but hmm. um, uh, he should get a lot more work. You know, the, the, the person at the root should get a lot more work and a lot more attention. More people should want to hire them. More people should say, can you art direct, you know, these other artists of mine that I want to have kind of the same look and feel that you did. But the, it's the, the, I, I guess, um, I, I guess I have a pretty strong feeling, and maybe I'm not, I, I guess I still have to explore it, but I have a pretty strong feeling that creativity, human creativity is actually a shared thing. It's, it's already a commons. It, it's not a thing where, you know, um, Picasso was the, the guy who came up with the, the melted watch. So anything that has a Dali. melted watch in it, you know, should, Dolly, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Picasso is the guy who stole that. I, um, uh, Dali. We're all stealing from each other is the thing. So, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you parse that into like, well, does that mean that a watch on a table that's not melted, is that Dali or is that somebody else? You know, if the, watch the whole melted look, a little bit, is that a melty thing? Else, you know, it's like all of that creativity stuff, it look, kind of like to Flancian's point, it's, it, it puts a priori limits on it when you think that's the, that's the, you know, that's, so, you know, I don't know, you should get more famous, but you shouldn't get more money for being at the root. So I like what you're saying a lot, and I agree. It's just that I have no employment opportunities for Shepard Ferry, but I would love to give him a financial reward to make it easier for him to continue being creative in the whatever way that he might have like like enjoyed doing. That's, that's a great use case. Yeah. And I think there should be societal mechanisms that enable that. Meaning a fund? Meaning, uh, you know, maybe, so it wouldn't be this, I, but, but just the, off the top of my head. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, there, there should be, there should be art councils and Shepard Ferry should get a lot of money because, uh, he's doing a really cool thing that many people like. But the, so, moment, you guess, the moment you aggregate it into small bodies that control pockets of money, you've suddenly introduced corruption and a bunch of other pressures. Yes and no. Mm -hmm. I, I, I recognize the, I, I agree with you. Um, they're, they're manipulable, they're corruptible, they're systems that want will will want to um self-sustain themselves whether or not they're being effective all that kind of stuff right and yet um that i think that's not a reason not to do it um uh so we can argue mechanisms yeah. well you're you're also putting all the onus and things on the original creator which isn't always a single person mm -hmm. so let's say i'm I'm Disney and I help put together and finance and produce a $150 million movie. There are, you know, several thousands of people who are working on that. You see in the credits, but what you don't see in the credits are 
the team of 50 people in the marketing department there, the 45 people in the distribution group, all the theater chain owners, all, you know, everybody from soup to nuts. And if that's a million people are touching that thing, which is in part is why it's as expensive as it is. So it's not just how do I remunerate the director and the actors, or maybe the guy who shot the thing mm -hmm. for cinematography, but it's every interstitial person along the way. How do I, how do I remunerate Flancian for being a Google engineer who has, he may not even work anywhere remotely close to YouTube, but some of his work I'm sure impacts YouTube as a distribution channel. And it's not, you don't see that. You don't hear it. You don't know it. And it's all the, it's all that invisible work. Right. It also needs to be supported as well. Yeah. So in, yeah, in, go ahead, please. in a copyright case, so I knew the guy who in the late eighties and early nineties helped to push Disney into China. And it literally was a state actor level play. And Disney was the only studio whose material could be distributed at all in China for years. So they had a monopoly and they were taking an essentially a 90% haircut on what they would have been making otherwise just to be in the market. And you know, that doesn't even touch on the censorship issues and all the other work they had to do to be there. But they literally, they were like, it's so valuable for us to be there and build a brand. We don't mind taking the loss. And whether we do it or not, it's all going to be pirated anyway. So we may as well take the loss and take the brand recognition for later. But it's taken decades for China to have distribution systems. And they're still probably only at 60 or 70% of what they would or could make out of it as a commercial thing. So it's, you know, it's, it's not just how do you do it and how easy is it to, to tip someone or give someone, but how do they then in turn to shepherd Ferry create a sweatshop for his marketing and distribution people for you to get his obey giant t-shirt and how do you hold him account to you know, treating those people well, or does he keep 99% of the money that comes in and, you know, pays nothing to the poor kid in Indonesia who actually sewed his t-shirt and you don't know, you have no way of knowing. So there, I, you know, it's such a crazy complex problem. So at, at the origin end of this, I've got this thought, uh, distributed accounting for value flows, which is basically the many different platforms that are trying to figure out how do we reward people in a community for creating value of some sort? What does that even mean? And that's a, a big open question. There's Comakery, there's Disco.coop. Uh, there's a, a, bunch of, a bunch of entities trying to solve that problem. The Open Collective, Closer to Us, Sensorica, uh, Coordinate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The Beckon Protocol. Um, and that feels to me like a really useful and interesting problem to solve because if, if that worked, then as you rewarded a movie, then you would drop your reward for the movie into the pool that would then just flow outward along this particular uh, set of distributions of value uh, if we wanted to do it that way. Um, yes. Yeah. I, I've got a friend who is a ostensibly a, a movie producer who develops and puts together things and they use a fund based thing and it works for them in part because it's a, you know, they're doing comic book fandom type hmm. commercial material. But even then the, a lot half more, you know, three quarters of this stuff they try and put into production doesn't go anywhere. And the fan base who is, you know, essentially they're pre-buying their movie tickets and saying, I, I'm going to invest in this project at the level of 10 bucks so that when it comes out, I, I, I you know, they're never going to see a piece of the pie. But as investors, they're, you know, essentially pre-buying the book or the ticket or the whatever. And the level of failure, even at that, and the, and the issues and the problems that she has 
trying to sustain that model may actually be way worse than the corporate stream model of going through traditional Hollywood, um, and which and she's done both. Mm -hmm. So it's you and know Hollywood. I I don't necessarily know that those things save save people's bacon at the end of the day either. And if, the, and if it does, it, it's sustainable, but they're literally, they're making a fraction of what they otherwise would or could have. Um, I guess I just wanted to point out that a lot of these, I think the, the end game, uh, the way I see it in uh, a lot of like uh, projects in this space is probably gonna look like a pattern we keep running into, I think, which is things that could be solved if we could like on a source of truth in a route for a resolution uh, a procedure, in a commons, in a default commons and so on. And, and in this context, I, I, I think about this in, in this way, I basically, I, I wrote about something about this in, in 2019, and I'm still looking for it. I wrote about something that sounds a lot like what we're discussing, so I'm super excited about this conversation, by the way. Um, and um, and you know, it goes back to a correlation problem as well, which is, uh, you know, how to, uh, like, essentially agree on a different like uh, like a, va um, a value flow like a network or like a, a flow network and actually have it have any chance uh, to replace it the, the, or, or to complement at first the uh, um, existing distribution methods and like the the idea I played with, uh, with it back then and I, I guess I wanted to like surface it uh, to get your opinion is like actually latch on to piracy say like we're gonna build on piracy we start with piracy because I looked and a lot of people were like, oh, Paris is a problem. Or Paris is, you know, like I'm more like a, a Paris is a solution camp, I guess. But like, uh, uh, you know, like we have all these copyright holders, these big companies and so on that are controlling the distribution uh, precisely of like profits and, and so on. Um, you know, if, assuming we could agree on like uh, one route for doing this, we could do the following, right? For everything that is media, so say movies to begin with uh, on topic, right? Uh, agree on an ID, right? So essentially, H M M M K V M P four, any kind of like a uh, format you can find on Pirate Day for a movie, you can match it uh, to like you know like uh, the actual uh, cultural artifact that you want to like model, and then uh, each of these could have like a distribution tree attached or many actually. So you know like we were we discuss going back to the discussion we discuss uh, should this should the root of the root node be the creator who is the creator in the case of a movie. Is the director? It's some, but you know, like there's probably many. So they, they, there's a, a sub problem. In the case of a book, maybe easier is the author if there's one. But you know, like a default distribution policy, and then you can say, you know, by default, whoever is a root node can say what the default tree is. So whenever you inject, uh, whenever someone someone donates to this uh, cultural artifact, saying like this is what the value he gave to me, uh, it flows down or it flows in a network and it doesn't need to be down, it doesn't need to be a tree. Uh, and by default, because someone has to set it, the creator receives probably a sizable chunk and gets to say what the default policy is if the person donating doesn't override, for example, right? You could do a run this system. I mean, and to some extent, this goes back to, I, I, I will sound like a crypto bro for like uh, one minute, right? But it goes down to uh, like the pitch of the many airdrops, which is, you know, you already have money here, essentially. So imagine, you know, people could donate through this uh, piracy embracing mechanism, and then authors, the book authors are, you know, are usually shortchanged by, by the big publishing houses, say, uh, uh, or that don't get the profits from, you know, that doesn't exist because people are not paying for, paying for piracy. They get donations this way. And the directors and the actors and, you know, the people that, uh, maybe the people that work in a movie, that produce a movie, could say, this is how we will distribute the, uh, any donations we get through the system, right? Uh, all these people could claim this money directly, essentially, you know, uh, using some uh, identification method, which again, is, is hugely complex, uh, a priori, but trivial if you agree on a source of truth, you know, just for the exercise. And then essentially, uh, this will be providing motivation for people to jump over to say uh, the same goes for even for like uh, for the big companies like Disney. Surely, 
I mean, even though I usually don't like Disney because of copyright and so on, surely the people in Disney working on marketing and so on still deserve some part of the donations, right? So, but essentially, this will give power back to the people to say how they want to distribute the proceeds of the artwork. And this seems like a trivial attack on the on the current uh, distribution systems. Uh, and I essentially don't see why it won't work. <laughs> like a lot of these things. Assuming we can agree on one such provider to be with critical mass. So here's a good question for you, Flancian. Do you know if you're a, an author and you have a deal with a big book publisher for your first book of of the one dollar of every one dollar that comes in, how much money goes to the author at the end of the day? Do, do you know what that number is? I will guess it varies widely, but I will expect it to be like what ten percent or something or something. Uh, it's the standard idiot level for a, a first-time author is about seven percent. Seven percent, right? I get this. I get in zero for the other chapter. So and ninety-three percent goes to the big publisher, who then splits it up and is paying for the physical printing of the book, the material, the marketing. Mm -hmm. The editing, the type typesetting, the typography, the art, the art direction, all the all the other bits and pieces. Right. Um, and I, I think we tend to overvalue the contributor of the, you know, what one might call the auteur or the big name, the movie director, you know, mm -hmm. even in Hollywood, the screenwriter who really is does the biggest chunk of the work and does it early and hopes to get it off the ground you know, they get no credit at all. And, mm -hmm. and in terms of payment, they get even less, um, you know, right. writers get paid peanuts. I you know. And at the same time, screenwriting is one of the most lucrative, well-paid writing jobs on the planet, um, per, at least per word and at a level of writing, because the average movie screenplay is written at a fourth grade level. Um, but it's I, that's part of the problem is I, we we always want to overlook the Flancians of the world who make the whole thing work, you know. But at the same time, as a platform, Google is taking generally uh, the average movie studio typically their fee is thirty percent off the top of almost everything as just a distribution fee, much less all the other pieces. Um, but from that perspective, YouTube is essentially taking an 80% rake off the top of everything and then giving a pittance to all the creators right. and everybody wants to be an influencer. They want to be famous for having, you know, a million followers on YouTube, but the number of people with over a million followers is a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall content. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they are making, you can't, you can't make, it's not a day job wage to try and do that. You have to have a, it, you know, it's a, a second hustle. So how do you reframe that? But it's, Google is such a huge player in the space. They're literally taking all the money off the top. And for that thing, it may be useful to have the small creators do a thing but you still google still has to pay to keep the lights on and do the distribution on your behalf so it's, right. it's, super uh, complicated. it's way more complicated than we're giving it any credit for that's for, for sure. sure no it's it's hugely complicated um, but I, I guess i'm still like thinking of whether like in the long term the distributed system may have like a wish like some evolutionary advantage right even the, going back to the influencer thing, you know, like in between platforms, the influencers in Wall Gardens, that's a great example. They are sort of like tied at the, uh, you know, joined at the hip with the platform, right? They, they, they are not very often not able to like move. They are like captive, like every use in a wall, in a wall garden, but like more obviously so maybe because their livelihood is tied to that. Um, and, you know, like building tools for like, a, 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 for like, a, for, that audience maybe could be like something that the commons could do better, essentially. And um, Sam, you arrived a little bit late, but we've we've sort of gone for quite a while here on on the theme of 
uh, are, are Dolly and all these sort of generative systems killing off creators? How do we reward them? All, all of that. That's sort of, that's kind of where we started. Uh, and we don't have to we don't have to stay on that thread for the whole call. We could uh, we could wander or check in or whatever we'd like to do. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we just went straight in right, from the chicken, right? It's, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it we just went whoop, yes. whoop, which is good. That's what we do. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a good time for the topic. <laughs> it certainly is timely. I think so. Yeah. I, I think that uh, any good fellowship should include generative members. <laughs> so I, I, I don't. I, I, I think the, the more interesting question for for us is how do we uh, how do we make good on the the opportunity to to have a much more robustly fleshed out world of of links mm -hmm. and structure if i can riff on that sam um so i'm really interested in, in like uh, one of the one of the dilemmas that i that that i chew on and that we're sort of bumping against here is hey intellectual ideas are should be used to help humanity and to help us sort our way out of all the problems we have but we wind up locking ideas away in lots of different ways um, for lots of different reasons and ip over protection is sort of one of the big labels uh, for some for some of that activity how do we make it so that people can still work together and cooperate to build what we know uh, into some some open space where we can uh, share it out and then and then apply it, which means a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, and so, trying to figure out how to how to implement that could be and 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 a piece of this conversation is making me realize that I'm just trying to get money to people so that they can stay alive and pay for you know shelter and food. Um, and there's another piece of it if you bump up even higher, which is hey maybe we're moving into fully automated luxury communism. And we won't need actual and, and the abundance society where we won't actually need money because things like shelter and food will be simple to get and accessible to most everybody uh, in some other way. And that, that's a revolution we will likely not live to see. But 100 years from now, who knows? Like, like larger, you know, changes that big have happened before, like the enclosure movements and the advent of industrialism and capitalism that 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 changed the world at least as significantly as what i'm describing here go ahead that's, yeah that's a very interesting like uh vision i wonder if like i went back to the recognition attribution fame uh, you know i wonder if like money will eventually lose this like uh, uh like you know chokehold on humanity to some extent where like we don't have money in some situations you will die uh, uh and but they will still eventually remain as a coordination mechanism right because even like an, in a postcard society presumably like you will still need this for example how do you attribute creativity uh, uh you know like uh, uh value to some extent how do you attribute our authorship uh, if we want to keep around the author uh, as resurrected, right? Uh, so, so it's it's it may it may mutate. So I guess uh, at that point you we, you need to ask: Do we still want to call money something which is like a more generic coordination device? Uh, but you know, it, it will be interesting to see, and hopefully, it will happen in our lifetimes. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I'm curious actually because we've used the word fame several times mm -hmm. in this framing and that it's useful for someone to be famous, what does that actually mean to be famous? And what is the value of being famous? And I would say that fame itself doesn't have any value except in a marketplace to put value on the thing, which is why Steven Spielberg can make any movie he pleases, including horrible ones if he really wanted to, primarily because he's famous for having made lots of good ones that made money in the past. So he trades his fame in for the ability to do those things. And sure, he'll make a big, 
you know, minority report every now and then, but he, he also has the ability to trade it out and force a studio to do something like Amistad or Schindler's List because he feels like that's a thing that needs to be seen and done. And his fame then in turn allows him to put movie stars into those cultural objects that he, you know, if I wanted to, to direct them, there's no way in a million years I would be given that opportunity. And so I would, I you think know, if you talk to De Niro, he would come act in your movie, but I'm just saying. Um, I, he might, but only because I have a personal relationship with him. So Damn it. Okay. Know. Can you invite him to the calls? Or, or really, honestly, I probably would call Pacino first, but you know, that's, <laughs> you know, it depends on how big I need the hair to be. Too bad Brando's mm -hmm. gone. Uh, but even at that, he's going to have an agent in his life who's going to say, no, you shouldn't go do your friend's thing. Or even in the, in both of their cases, although probably a little more Pacino, Pacino likes doing theater and plays and wants to do that. But it's incredibly hard even for him to do that because of the way the financial system works. Mm -hmm. And for him to do it, it means reaching into his own pocket to finance it himself, which is an incredibly hard thing for almost anybody to want to do because you know it's a, a money losing proposition, which is why Spielberg leverages his fame to get somebody else to pick up the ticket. So you get, you know, depending on how Hollywood's working today, you know, you go out and you try and find the, the Ely Samaha or the Arnon Milchan who is running gun money out of some foreign country and needs a way to expatriate that. So you take a piece of his finance stream and you use Hollywood finance to move that money around in a way that, you know, it's, it's payola and he's losing, you know, 20 or 30% as a fee for doing it where they are or were, but you know, that's, you know, with the cost of doing business. Um, and that's mostly how Hollywood works, honestly, is by financial schemes to move money from one place to another. I, that you know, most people just generally have no idea that that's what's going on. Um, but you know, there's a reason Dodi Fayed was a movie producer. <laughs> Not you know, he liked movies, but there were other reasons, other things going on that that caused that type of material. So. It's a great analysis, Chris. Um, I also want to recognize a different part of fame, which is the respect of thousands or millions or billions of people um, over months or years or decades or centuries, which is which is not fungible, um, doesn't feed you, but it it means something. Yeah. Oh no, there and I. You can look at. Um... In fact, David Graeber's last book, um, well, second to last book, uh, The Dawn of Everything, he looks at it, you know, early indigenous societies and how they operated. And essentially, we stole the idea of freedom from them to create what is now our society that is kind of a fusion of that type of cultural, tribal let's keep it all together and support each other and we somehow have managed to overlay uh, industrial industrialization and capitalization on top of it which is a, a weird or crazy thing and then a Flancian may appreciate this his last book mm -hmm. that came out it, it was written in french in 2019 but it just came out earlier this month is called pirate enlightenment and we have this mythology of pirates from the seven to late 1600s, early 1700s. But he posits that a lot of the Enlightenment movement was put on and subsumed by pirate ships and the structure that pirates actually use. So. At the time, pirates were way more egalitarian and democratic mm -hmm. in the structure of how their ships worked. 
and we don't we don't see that because we're working on the mythology of what came after a hundred years later. Um, but you know, he looks at a case study in Mad, uh, you know, a, a hive of pirates in Madagascar and how they influenced the world with ideas of freedom and enlightenment in ways that we never would have had otherwise. Um, but then they, their marketing department was selling something else to foreign government. So that's what we get. That's the picture we maintain of pirates when in fact it was, they were many democratic societies that were incredibly much more egalitarian than we give them credit for now. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you for that. So, so piracy may, you know, we, we give it a negative connotation, but piracy is, you know, maybe responsible for our current form of government. Uh, two things. Uh, the book Under the Black Flag is really good about this. And there's a couple others about sort of uh, insurance among pirates, uh, democracy among pirates, a whole bunch of other really cool things. And then um, you said earlier that, that um, capitalism or, or whatever our modern systems kind of overlaid on top of this other way to do things. I really like my own take on this is that capitalism had to shove all the other things out and neutralize them because capitalism needs a labor force that is willing to kind of go do anything. And if there's if there's a bunch of communities that are having a great time and that have control over their land that you then can't appropriate and like, you know, dig up or, 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 or plunder, um, capitalism really doesn't like that. So it will do everything it can to destroy the other means of making a living. At least that's my perception, my jaded perception of it, reading things like Against the Grain and uh, Dawn of Everything and whatever else. Um, so, as, and, and, and part of our problem right now is that our brains are way down the capitalist hole. Uh, witness the first uh, 45 minutes of conversation for this call, trying to figure out how to reward artists to stay alive mm -hmm. and put food on their families. Um, so far down the capitalist uh, hole that imagining other ways of living together is incredibly difficult for people. Like, we can't do it. And, you know, when people say, well, what alternatives are there? I'm like, well, the Algonquins basically had matri matriarchal societies where the excess of the hunt and the gather went into longhouses and the elder women of the tribe allocated it back out to whatever families <clears throat> needed food or, or, or whatever they had. They're like that, that was the, the redistribution mechanism and it worked, you know, worked out just fine. Um, and there's, and there's tons of other mechanisms. And part of the message of Dawn of Everything is look like humans were experimenting like crazy, trying to figure out how to make these things work. And then a, a couple models sort of wind up dominating. Sorry for the long monologue. No, that's okay. I mean, we did, we definitely have, the, there's something about capitalism that forces dramatic change and improvements. It's not, and it's not just you know, the industrial revolution, but it was the industrial revolution combined with capitalism that's gotten us much farther, much faster. So the question is, how can you still have that, but still have those other societies which moved along and didn't evolve nearly as rapidly? Um, and, you know, if you, I, I suspect, well, other than the, the motivation of having more money, you know, having the shift and changes of improvement quickly over time would be a nice thing if we could also go back to those long house societies. Yeah, my hope there is that uh, the, the internet, well, I guess we are all fans of the internet in the field of the link, but like that it may be the, the, the tool that we were missing. So essentially like uh, allowing communities to become self-sustaining, self-governing to some extent uh, in a way that previously could only be done by force or by use of money, right? So, you know, like in an authoritarian way or, uh, you know, through capitalism uh, to some extent. Um, and, you know, I guess we will, we are seeing that happen probably. So we are like feeling the storm. Uh, sometimes I personally feel it's not going quickly enough for many, uh, but, uh, and here I go, I, guess we, I go back to like Sam's question, which is like, how can we actually, I guess, like take the opportunity or like, or, you know, like just nudge, yeah, find a fulcrum, like find the opportunity and, 
uh, an exploit. Uh, I don't know. I, in my mind, I always goes back to coordination point. You know, what is the minimum uh, that we need to get like uh, people to to be able to coordinate on general uh, uh, you know projects. Um, uh, yes, but that's that's the the you know the glasses through which are you the whole thing. Yes. It's it's really cheap now to coordinate, so I don't think we need any more mm -hmm. capabilities. Uh, we just need the coordination. It's like the difference between mm -hmm. an experiment being replicable in theory and actually being replicated. Right. We need to do the work. The, the yeah, we need, we, and you know, I think we, we need to get good at creating societies with new norms, which means we need to be creating hundreds and thousands mm -hmm. of them. We have to do it a lot. Uh, so mm -hmm. 